Hello students, this is our 7th lecture in the lecture series Advanced Materials for Energy and Information Technology. Here onwards we shall discuss about the materials for information technology. In this lecture we shall discuss about generations of computers. Computers are the basic units of information technology. Here is a cartoon picture and you can see as human beings evolved from apes and acquired newer skills to become intelligent and finally homo sapiens are considered to be the most intelligent species on this earth. Similarly, our computers also undergone a series of evolution incorporating innovations from time to time and newer applications made computers smarter and smarter with each passing day. Based on the characteristics of various computers developed from time to time, they are categorized as generation of computer. The first generations were based on vacuum tubes. The second generation is considered to be the advent of diodes and triodes. The third generation was the era of integrated circuits. The fourth generation is dedicated to microprocessors. And the fifth generation of the computers is based on modern computing and artificial intelligence. This phase is still under development though there are some applications such as voice recognition that are being used today. Quantum computation and molecular and nanotechnology will radically change the face of computers in the years to come. In this lecture, we shall briefly overview the different generations of computers and we shall go through the materialistic details of the components on which these generations are based. The first generation of computers spanned from 1942-1956. The first computer systems used vacuum tubes for circuitry and magnetic drums for memory and were often enormous, taking up entire rooms. These computers could calculate in milliseconds these computers were very expensive to operate and in addition to using a great deal of electricity, the first computers generated a lot of heat, which was often the cause of malfunctions. The first generation computers relied on machine language, the lowest level programming language understood by the computers to perform operations and they could only solve one problem at a time. It would take operators days or even weeks to set up a new problem. Input was based on punched cards and paper tape and output was displayed on printouts. The Univac and ENIAC computers are examples of first generation computing devices. The Univac was the first commercial computer delivered to a business client, the US Census Bureau in 1951. The other models in this category are EDWAC, IBM 701, and IBM 650. The crucial parts in the first generation computers were the vacuum tubes used for circuitry. Vacuum tubes were used for performing logic operations and store data. The vacuum tube is a device that controls electric current through a vacuum in a sealed container. Vacuum tubes mostly rely on thermionic emission of electrons from a hot filament or a cathode heated by the filament. This type of vacuum tubes are called a thermionic tube or thermionic valve. A photo tube, however, achieves electron emission 
through the photoelectric effect. Not all electron tubes contain vacuum. There are gas filled tube subdevices that rely on the properties of discharge through an ionized gas. Vacuum tubes were invented in during 1910 and were a basic component for electronics throughout the first half of the century, which saw the diffusion of radio, television, radar, sound reinforcement, sound recording and reproduction, large telephone networks, analog and digital computers, as well as industrial process control systems. Here in this picture is displayed a schematic diagram of a diode and a triode. In a diode, the electrons from the hot cathode flow towards the positive anode, but not vice versa. In a triode, a grid is introduced between the plate and the filament that is cathode, and the voltage applied to the grid controls the plate current or the anodic current. Here in this slide, the schematic diagrams of a diode and a triode has been shown on the left hand side. Besides this, the symbols for triode, tetrode and the pentagrid have been also shown. In a triode symbol, from top to bottom are shown plate or anode, control grid, cathode and heater filament. In a tetrode symbol, from top to bottom are plate anode, screen grid, control grid, cathode and the heater filament are shown. In a pentagrid, converter contains five grids between the cathode and the plate anode. This is quite a complicated structure to fine tune the electricity passing through it. A magnetic drum is the early version of computer memory widely used during 1950 and 1960s. The magnetic drum was invented by Gustav Kuschek in 1932 in Austria. Many computers used the magnetic drum as a core memory to store programs and data read from or written on the drum using such carriers as punched tapes or punch cards. The magnetic drum is a large metal cylinder with outside surface covered with ferromagnetic recording material. To put it simply, this is a hard drive but in the form of a cylinder rather than a flat disk. A number of sensing heads move round the drum, each on its own track. The key difference between the drum and the hard drive is the drum heads cannot move freely round the drum to search for a required track. The magnetic drum performance fully depends its rotation speed. While both rotation speed and sensing head travel speed are most important parameters for hard drives. Nevertheless, Magnetic drums had clear performance problems and programmers often wrote codes manually on the magnetic drum surface to reduce time required to find the following command. They did it by carefully measuring the time required to find a certain command and the time of computer readiness for the following command. Then they placed this command on the magnetic drum so that it drove up in time under the sensing head. This time delay compensation technique is called the transition coefficient or alternation. It is still used in today's hard drive controllers.
A punch card is a piece of stiff paper that can be used to contain digital data represented by the presence or absence of holes in predefined positions. Digital data can be used for data processing applications or used to directly control automated machinery. Punch cards were widely used through much of the 20th century in the data processing industry where specialized and increasingly complex unit record machines organized into semi-automatic data processing systems. Used punch cards for data input, output, and storage. The IBM 12 row oblique 18 column punch cards format come to dominate the industry. Many early digital computers use punch cards as a primary medium for input of both computer programs and data. While punch cards are now obsolete as a storage medium as of year 2012, some voting machines still use punch cards to record the votes. Punch cards were hugely influenced and inspired by Jacquard's loam punch cards. Here in the picture on the right hand side is shown a close up view of a Jacquard's loam chain constructed using 18 to 26 hole punch cards. These were used for developing design patterns on the fabrics. We have already seen this in the first lecture. The Jackard's head used replaceable punch cards to control a sequence of operation to develop a pattern on the fabric. It is considered an important step in the history of computing hardware. The ability to change the pattern of the loom's weave by simply changing cards was an important conceptual precursor to the development of computer programming and data entry. Charles Babbage knew of Jacquard's machine and planned to use cards to store programs in his analytical engine. In the late 19th century, Hermann Hollrith took the idea of using punch cards to store information a step further when he created a punch card tabulating machine which he used to input data for the 1890s US Census. A large data processing industry using punch card technology was developed in the first half of the 20th century, dominated initially by the International Business Machine Corporation or the IBM, with its line of unit record equipment. The cards were used for data, however, with programming done by plug boards. Some early computers such as 1944 IBM Automatic Sequence Controlled Calculator Howard Mark I received program instruction from a paper tape punched with holes similar to Jacquard's string of cards. Later, computers executed programs from higher speed memory through cards were commonly used to load the program into memory. Punch card remain in use in computing up to until the mid of 1980s. Machine language is the lowest level programming language except for the computers that utilize programmable microcode. Machine languages are the only languages understood by the computers. While easily understood by computers, machine languages are almost impossible for humans to use because they consist entirely of numbers. The assembly language contains the same instructions as the machine language, but the instructions and the variables have names instead of being just numbers. Assembly language programs are translated into machine language by a program called an assembler. Every CPU or the central processing unit of the computer has its own unique machine language. Programs must be written or recompiled, therefore to run on different types of computers. Sometimes referred to as machine code or object code, machine language is a collection of binary digits or bits 
that the computer reads and interprets. Machine language is the only language a computer is capable of understanding. The exact machine language for a program or action can differ by operating system on the computer. The specific operating system will dictate how a compiler writes a program or action into machine language. Computer programs are written in one or more programming languages like C++, Java or Visual Basic. A computer cannot directly understand the programming languages used to create computer programs, so the program code must be compiled. Once a program code is compiled, the computer can understand it because the program code is turned into machine language. A binary code represents text, computer processor instructions, or any other data using a two symbol system. The two symbol system used is often 0 and 1 from the binary number system. The binary code assigns a pattern of binary digits, also known as bits, to each character instruction, etc. For example, a binary string of 8 bits can represent any of 256 possible values and can therefore represent a wide variety of different items. Here on the left hand side of the slide is shown the binary code for the word Wikipedia. In computing and telecommunications, binary codes are used for various methods of encoding data such as character strings into bit strings. Those methods use fixed width or variable width strings. In a fixed width binary code, each letter, digit or other character is represented by a bit string of the same length. That bit string interpreted as a binary number is usually displayed in code tables in octal, decimal or hexadecimal notation. There are many character sets and many character encodings for them. It's a common theme throughout the modern world that everything in a computer's brain comes down to ones and zeros. You've most likely heard that this code of ones and zeros is what's referred to as binary. And while almost everybody knows that this is somehow related to what computers do, very few of us seem to understand what binary is or why computers use it. If you want to know, then this video is for you, because it's actually a very simple concept and still quite fascinating. Before we get to computers, let's talk about what binary itself is, as it existed long before computers did. Binary is nothing more than a system of counting. To understand how it works, let's look at two other systems of counting, tally marks and the glorious base 10 positional that we all know and love today. Tally marks are the simplest counting system imaginable. However many things you have, you put down that many marks, easy as pie, but not very efficient. Meanwhile, base 10 positional, which is what we use today, uses a different symbol to represent different amounts of things. With the numbers 0 through 9, we can recognize that each symbol indicates a different amount of things. If we need to represent something higher than 9, we add a digit to the left, roll this first digit back to 0, and start over. This system is very efficient compared to tally marks because each digit we add exponentially increases the amount of things we can represent. Because in this system we add a new digit every 10 things, each digit represents an increasing power of 10. This is the number of ones we have, the number of tens, the number of hundreds, the number of thousands, and so on. Now this is probably something you already know, but it's very important to keep it in mind when we talk about binary. Now binary works the exact same way as based in positional, but instead of each digit going from 0 to 9, it goes from 0 to 1. Counting upwards in binary sounds like this, 0, 1, 10, 11, 100, 101, 110, 111, and 1000. Because each digit of binary has only two values and not 10, each additional digit represents an increasing power of 2 rather than an increasing power of 10. So this is the number of 1s we have, the number of 2s, 4s, 8s, 16s, 32s, 64s, 128s, and so on. Not nearly as efficient as base 10, but exponentially more efficient than tally marks. Literally. So now that we know how binary works, let's talk about computers. Why did the first computer creators, as wise and intelligent as they are, 
waste their time with such an ineffective system of counting? Well, it's because of a physical limitation on how computers work. Everything a computer does comes down to what's known as microtransistors. Simple, tiny, incy-bincy little switches that can either be on or off, and can be flipped on or off with a very weak electrical charge. The first goal was to get computers to count, and to get them to count by using these switches, we could use the tally system, meaning the number of on switches equals the number of things we have, or we could use the much more efficient system of binary, where each switch represents a digit of binary. Eight transistors using the tally system could represent a number as large as eight by turning all of them on. With binary, we can represent a number as high as 255. An on switch means a one, and an off switch means a zero. Now is a good time to mention that a single transistor is what's known as a bit, which stands for binary digit. A byte is eight of these bits in a row, which means any number between zero and 255. So if binary is just a system of counting, what do people mean when they explain how to spell things in binary? Well, what they really mean is how to spell things with ASCII. The American Standard Code for Information Interchange is a way to convert a computer's data, which can only be in numbers, and turn it into letters for humans to have an easier time to work with. ASCII simply assigns a character to each value represented by a byte of binary. And because a byte has eight digits of binary to work with, and eight digits of binary can represent up to 255 values, ASCII had 255 letters and symbols to choose from, more than enough for the entire alphabet, punctuation marks, and other symbols. For example, the corresponding ASCII number for an uppercase A is 65. Now 65 in base 10 is equal to 1 million and 1 in binary. So whenever you type in an uppercase A in a word program, a coding program, or a scripting program or whatever, somewhere there's a little tiny row of eight transistors arranged in the pattern of off, on, off, 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 on, which represents 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 in binary, which is interpreted as 65 in base 10, which is converted by ASCII into an uppercase A. You're likely starting to get a feel for the staggering amount of transistors required to write something as simple as a Facebook status, let alone all the different coding that your computer has to do to make the screen light up, play games, calculate massive values, and so on. Well, long before we got to the point where your phone can play three-dimensional games, it became clear that numbers as high as 255 just weren't going to cut it. Regardless of how many bytes we had, and it was a lot, even adding four fully active bytes together could only get a number as high as 1020. To solve this problem, new computers were designed to recognize two bytes as one single number. So now instead of referencing one line of eight transistors, computers could reference two lines giving 16 digits worth of binary. This was a huge help because it increased the amount of representable numbers exponentially from 255 up to 65,535. When you hear people talking about the difference between 8-bit and 16-bit, this is more or less it. Now that doesn't mean that a 16-bit system is exponentially that much more powerful, because your program isn't always going to be utilizing all of these numbers in each byte that it represents, it just has the option to, which opens up lots of doors. Well, this could go on for ages and ages, but I want to end this particular video right here so as not to be overwhelming. In future videos, I will explain how computers use these numbers to decide which pixel is what color on your monitor, what the different components of your computer are for, and how hard drives store binary digits on a spinning disk rather than in transistors. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, liking and subscribing is always a huge help. While I've been enjoying making these instructional videos, I might move them to a different channel soon and continue doing comedic gaming related things on this channel so as not to confuse YouTube's search algorithm, which I think I am. Here is a picture of ENIAC, that is Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, the first general purpose programmable digital computer. ENIAC weighed 30 tons and contained 18,000 vacuum tubes and the cost was enormous, about $487,000.
you can appreciate its size as it's accommodated in a complete hall size room. Here is another computer Colossus which contained 1600 vacuum tubes. Colossus was the name of a series of computers developed by British code breakers in 1943 to 1945 to help in the crypto analysis of the Lorentz cipher. Colossus used thermionic valves that is vacuum tubes and thyrotrons to perform boolean and counting operations. Colossus is thus regarded as the world's first programmable electronic digital computer although it was programmed by plugs, switches and not by a stored program. Colossus was designed by the indie engineer Tommy Flowers to solve a problem posed by mathematician Max Newman and the Government Code and Cipher School at Bletchley Park. Alan Turing's use of probability in the crypto analysis contributed to its design. One of the common gas filled tubes, Thyrotron, was used in Colossus. Thyrotron is a type of gas filled tube used as a high power electrical switch and control rectifier. Thyrotrons can handle much greater currents than similar hard vacuum tubes. Here is shown a list of early vacuum tube computers. Now we shall discuss about the second generation computers. The second generation era lasted between 1956 to 1963. The world should see transistors replace vacuum tubes in the second generation of computers. The transistor was invented at Bell Labs in the year 1947 but did not see widespread use in the computers until the late 1950s, almost more than 10 years of span. The transistor was far superior to the vacuum tubes, allowing computers to become smaller, faster, cheaper, more energy efficient and more reliable than their first generation predecessors. Though the transistor is still generated a great deal of heat that subjected the computer to damage, it was a vast improvement over the vacuum tubes. The second generation computers still relied on punch cards for input and printouts for output. The second generation computers moved from cryptic binary machine language to symbolic or assembly languages, which allowed computers to specify instructions in words. High level programming languages were also being developed at this time, such as early versions of COBOL and Fortran. These were also the first computers that stored their instructions in their memory, which moved from a magnetic drum to magnetic core technology. The first computers in this generation were developed for the atomic energy industry. Here in this picture is shown the efficiency of a transistor used in second generation computers over the vacuum tubes which were used in the first generation computers. One transistor efficiently replaced 
approximately 40 vacuum tubes. Throughout the early 1960s, there were a number of commercially successful second generation computers used in business universities and government from companies such as Burroughs, Control Data, Honeywell, IBM, Sperry, RAM and others. These second generation computers were also of solid state design and contained transistor in place of vacuum tubes. They also contain all the components we associate with the modern day computer that is printers, tape, storage, disk storage, memory, operating systems and stored programs. By 1965, most large business routinely process financial information using second generation computers. It was the stored program and programming languages that gave computers the flexibility to finally be cost effective and productive for business use. The stored program concept means that instructions to run a computer for a specific function known as a program were held inside the computer's memory and could quickly be replaced by a different set of instructions for a different function. The computer could print customer invoices and minutes later design products or calculate paychecks. These functions were largely dominated to be performed by the transistors. The second generation computers saw several landmarks during its development. One of these landmarks is the development of COBOL, that is Common Business Oriented Language. Grace Murray Hooper was one of the first computer programmers to work on the Harvard Mark I. She was also a United States Navy Rear Admiral. COBOL is one of the first high-level programming languages. She invented the first compiler, a program that translates programming code to machine language. COBOL came during the time when the academic computer scientists were generally not interested in business applications at all. COBOL was created and were not involved in its design. It was effectively designed from the ground up as a computer language for business with an emphasis on inputs and outputs whose only data tapes were numbers and strings of text. COBOL was being criticized throughout its life for its verbosity, design process and poor support for structural programming. These weaknesses result in monolithic and though intended to be English-like, not easily comprehensible and verbose programs. In the late 1950s, computer users and manufacturers were becoming concerned about the rising cost of programming. A 1959 survey had found that in any data processing installation, the programming cost would come around 800,000 US dollars on an average and that translating programs to run on new hardware would cost an additional 600,000 US dollars and at a time when new programming languages were proliferating at an everlasting rate, the same survey suggested that if a common business oriented language were used, conversion would be far cheaper and faster. Hooper's greatest technical achievement was to create the tools that would allow humans to communicate with computers in terms other than ones and zeros. This advanced influenced all future programming and software design and laid the foundation for the development of today's user-friendly personal computers. Hooper found the first computer bug, a dead moth, that had gotten into the Mark I and whose wings were blocking the reading of the holes in the paper tape. The word bug had been used to describe a defect since at least 1889, but Hooper is credited with the word debugging to describe the work to eliminate a program fault.
The huge percentage of Kabul court is still in use and comes as a shock when amazing Grace Hooper invented Kabul in 1959. She invented one of the wonders of the world. In fact, it might surprise you that 60% of the retail applications and 75% of the financial applications are written in Kabul. There are 200 billion lines of code. That's surprising trio of statistics, but Kabul Fote is batch processing and we still do a great deal of that. Here is a picture of Harvard Mark I, an early proto-computer built during World War II in the United States. While early computer scientists were working on analog computing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, across town, Harvard University professor Howard Aiken was working with digital devices for calculation. He had begun to realize in hardware something like the 19th century English inventor Charles Babbage's analytical engine which he had read about. We have already seen about the Charles Babbage's analytical engine in the lecture 1. Starting in 1937, Aiken laid out detailed plans for a series of four calculating machines of increasing sophistication based on different technologies from the largely mechanical Mark I to an electronic Mark IV. Fortran or formula translation, the first widely accepted high-level computer language was completed by John Backus and his co-workers at the International Business Machines IBM Corporation in April 1957. The Fortran programming language was conceived in early 1950s, the name produced from the two words formula translation. In 1966, the language was standardized and Fortran 4 was born. Revision of the language led to Fortran 77, the language which we use today. The standard for Fortran 90 is now available, although not yet in widespread use. Fortran 77 is a subset of Fortran 90. Fortran was designed for the scientists and engineers and has dominated this field. For the past 30 years, Fortran has been used for such projects as the design of bridges and aeroplane structures. It is used for factory automation control, for storm drainage design, analysis of scientific data and so on. In addition to stimulating the introduction of new languages, Fortran encouraged the development of operating systems. Programming languages had already grown into simple operating systems called monitors. Operating systems since then have been greatly improved so that they support, for example, simultaneously active programs, multi-programming and the networking combining of multiple computers. Now we shall learn about the third generation computers which span between 1963 to 1975. The third generation computers were largely based on ICs that is integrated circuits. These incorporated many transistors and electronic circuits on a single chip. The size reduced to small as compared to the second generation computers but the processor became faster and more efficient. The development of the integrated circuit was the hallmark of the third generation of computers. Transistors were miniaturized and placed on silicon chips called semiconductors which drastically increased the speed and efficiency of computers. Instead of punch cards and printouts, users interacted with the third generation computers through keyboards and monitors and interface with an operating system. 
which allowed the device to run many different applications at one time with a central program that monitored the memory. Computers for the first time became accessible to a mass audience because they were smaller and cheaper than their predecessors. The integrated circuit is a small electronic device made out of a semiconductor material. The first integrated circuit was developed in 1950s by Jack Kilby of Texas Instrument and Robert Noyes of Fairchild Semiconductor. Here is a picture of the first semiconductor shown here. Jack Kilby was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics on December 10, 2000. As of 2012, typical chip areas range from a few square millimeters to around 450 millimeters square with up to 9 million transistors per millimeter square. The integrated circuit is a vapor thin slice of extremely purified silicon crystal. A single integrated circuit has many transistors, resistors and capacitors along with the associated circuitry encapsulated in a small package with many leads. The integrated circuits enable less power consumption and the computer to reduce its size and become more faster and more reliable. The third generation computers used high level language programming, which include C, Java, JavaScript, etc. An integrated circuit or monolithic integrated circuit, often referred as an IC or a chip or a microchip, is a set of electronic circuits on one small plate chip of semiconductor material, normally silicon. This can be much smaller than a discrete circuit made from independent components. ICs can be made very compact having up to a several billion transistors and other electronic components in an area the size of a fingernail. The width of each conducting line in a circuit can be made smaller and smaller as the technology advances. In year 2008, it dropped below 100 nanometer and now is tens of nanometers. Here in this picture is shown integrated circuit from an EPROM memory chip. Integrated circuit showing the memory blocks, the supporting circuitry and fine silver wires which connect the integrated circuit die to the legs of the packaging. Another picture is the synthetic detail of an integrated circuit through four layers of planarized copper interconnect down to the polysilicon pink wells in grayish color and substrate in the green color. Magnetic core memory was the predominant form of random access computer memory for almost 20 years between the years 1955 and 1975. Such memory is often just called core memory or informally the core. Core memory use toroids or rings of hard magnetic material, usually a semi-hard ferrite as transformer cores, where each wire threaded through the core serves as a transformer winding. Three or four wires pass through each core. Each core stores one bit of information. A core can be magnetized in either the clockwise or counterclockwise direction. The value of the bit stored in a core is 0 or 1 according to the direction of what the core is magnetized. 
Electric current pulses in some of the wires through the core allow the direction of the magnetization in that core to be set in either direction, thus storing 1 or a 0. Another wire through each core, the sense wire is used to detect whether the core changed state. The process of reading the core causes the core to be reset to a zero, thus erasing it. This is called destructive readout. When not being read or written, the cores maintain the last value they had, even if the power is turned off. Therefore, they are a type of non-volatile memory. Using the smaller cores and wires, the memory density of cores slowly increased and by the late 1960s, a density of about 32 kilobytes per cubic foot was typical. However, reaching this density required extremely careful manufacture, almost always carried out by the hand in spite of repeated major efforts to automate the process. The cost declined over this period from about $1 per bit to about $0.01 cent per bit. The introduction of the first semiconductor memory chips in the late 60s, which initially created static random access memory, began to erode the market of the core memory. The first successful dynamic random access memory, the Intel 1103, followed in 1970s. Its availability in quantity at 1 cent per bit marketed the beginning of the end of the core memory. Although core memory is now obsolete, computer memory is still sometimes called core even though it is made of semiconductors, particularly by people who had worked with the machines having real core memory. The files that resulted from saving the entire content of memory to disk for debugging purpose, when a major error occurs, are still anarchistic called core dumps. Here in this picture is shown close up of core plane. The distance between the rings is roughly 1 millimeter. The green horizontal wires are X, the Y wires are dull brown and vertical towards the back. The sense wires are diagonal, colored in orange, and the inhibit wires are vertically twisted pairs. Diagram of a 4 into 4 plane of magnetic memory in a XY line coincident current setup. X and Y are drive lines, S is sense, Z is inhibit. Arrows indicate the direction of the current for writing. The memory cards replace the core memory, the 100 bits capacity to a 2 GB bit capacity and you can see the size comparison. Integrated circuits have two main advantages over discrete circuits, cost and performance. Cost is low because the chips with all their components are printed as a unit by photolithography rather than being constructed one transistor at a time. Furthermore, packaged integrated circuits use much less material than discrete circuits. Performance is high because the integrated circuits components switch quickly and consume little power compared to their discrete counterparts. As a result of the small size and close proximity of the components. Here in this picture is shown the process of photolithography. The steps involved masking and patterning. We shall see some more details in the next lecture. Examples of some mainframe computers developed during this generation are ICL or International Computer Limited, IBM, International Business Machine Corporation, and some more computers in the list as shown below.
In this generation, remote processing, time sharing, real time, multi programming operating systems were used. High level languages such as Fortran 2 to Fortran 4, COBOL, Pascal, PL1, BASIC, ALGOL 68, etc., etc., were used during this generation. Now we shall see the story of fourth generation computers. The fourth generation computers is marked by the use of very large scale integrated circuits or VLSI. VLSI circuits having about 5000 transistors and other circuit elements and their associated circuits on a single chip made it possible to have microcomputers of fourth generation. Fourth generation computers became more powerful, compact, re reliable and affordable. As a result, it gave rise to personal computers revolution. In this generation, time sharing, real time networking, distributed operating systems were used. These computers use all the high level languages like C and C++, DBase, etc. Very large scale integration or VLSI is the process of creating an integrated circuit by combining thousands of transistors into a single chip. VLSI began in the year 1970 when complex micro semiconductors and communication technologies were being developed. A microprocessor incorporates the function of a computer central processing unit CPU on a single integrated circuit or at most a few integrated circuits. Here is a picture of Intel 4004, the first commercial microprocessor. One microprocessor is capable of replacing approximately a thousand integrated circuits. The microprocessor brought the fourth generation of computers as thousands of integrated circuits were built onto a single silicon chip. What in the first generation filled an entire room could now fit in the palm of the hand. The Intel 4004 chip developed in 1971 located all the components of the computer from the central processing unit and memory to input output controls on a single chip. In 1981, IBM introduced its first computer for the home user and in 1984, Apple introduced the Macintosh. Microprocessors also moved out of the realm of desktop computers and into many areas of life as more and more everyday products began to use microprocessors. As these small computers became more powerful, they could be linked together to form networks, which eventually led to the development of the Internet. Fourth generation computers also saw the development of GUIS and mouse and handheld devices. The fifth generation computing devices based on artificial intelligence are still in development phase though there are some applications such as voice recognition that are being used today. The use of parallel processing and superconductors is helping to make the artificial intelligence a reality. Furthermore, quantum computation and molecular and nanotechnology will radically change the face of computers in the years to come. The goal of fifth generation computing is to develop devices that respond to natural language input and capable of learning and self-recognition and self-organization as well. We shall see some details of artificial intelligence in the next lecture. The fifth generation of computers involve all the higher level languages like C and C++, Java, .NET, etc. Artificial intelligence includes robotics, neural networking, game playing, 
development of expert systems to make decisions in the real life situations natural language understanding and generation the artificial intelligence a symbol of fifth generation computing gives a lot of space for personal and software industry to boom these have gained enormous speed reliability and storage capacity the computers have become 100 times smaller than the first generation computer that is anya here is a collage of pictures showing the summary of first to fourth generation computers the first generation computers heavily dependent on a varieties of large number of vacuum tubes the second generation computer witness the era of transistors the third generation computers show the era of integrated circuits and the fourth generation computers involve microprocessors these microprocessors are still evolving and with newer and newer designs the speed and reliability is enormously enhanced with each passing year now we shall see some quick pick topics about the storage hardware there are some topics which i cannot include because it will be too long to accommodate in the lecture so we shall see some main portions only and some of the details are covered in the next lecture the first in the list is the storage hardware the storage hardware is the device permanently storing the data for future use there are two types of storage devices primary and secondary The common term come across is random access memory or RAM. This is the primary memory that holds data while the program is running. It is an electronic memory that erases the data when the computer is switched off. Second is read only memory or ROM. This is also a primary memory that knows the basic information about the hardware and settings of your computer. the data on this memory cannot be changed the other memory devices are magnetic disks or tape devices these devices provide fast access and storage capacities the first in this list is hard disk or hd this is also called disk drive all personal computers have hard disk the famous external hard disk has capacities from 80 gigabytes to terabytes second in this list is diskette or floppy disk its memory is 1.44 megabyte it's often called floppy disk because it's made of flexible material these are now no more in use or very limited in certain very, very old instruments next in the list is zip drive this was developed by lomega corporation it is a small portable disk drive with capacities of 100 to 40 and 750 mb magnetic tape is used to store data in sequence they are commonly used in audio and video tapes for example cassettes vhs and beta max these are very difficult to find nowadays because cds have taken over the market somewhat more advanced types of storage devices are optical storage devices these involve the use of high powered laser beams to store the information these include cd rom cd rom compact disk read only memory its storage capacity is 540 to 748 mb it is the oldest and best defined optical storage technology cd rom compact disk recordable allows recording of data but data cannot be erased once they are recorded later on rewritable cds 
evolved in the market which could write and rewrite as many times as it allows. CDRW is the compact disk rewritable. This allows you to rewrite, erase and update data. Capacity is about 650 to 800 MB. DVD that is digital versatile disk or digital video disk. This can hold up to 4.7 gigs of information which is enough for a 133 minute video. Another kind of storage hardware is the flash drive. This is also called USB flash drive or thumb drive. From megabytes, today's flash drive capacity is about 128 to 256 gigabytes. Now we shall see some output hardwares. These are the devices that translate information processed by the computer into a form that user can understand. Output information may be a hard copy or soft copy. Hard copy outputs are tangible like printed essays on bond paper and microfilm. The soft copy outputs are those that can be seen on the screen. Here is some picture of hard copy output devices. Two types of printers are shown here. Impact pin printer. This kind of printer has contact with the paper, for example, dot matrix. Non-impact printer. The printer that does not strike the characters against ribbon or paper. The plotter is a device that produces permanent graphic output in large sheets. Some more hardwares are listed here. One is cathode ray tube or CRT. It is the most popular soft copy output device used by the microcomputer systems. The cathode ray tubes are being rare nowadays, only used in some of the old installations for running some old instruments. These are largely being replaced by liquid crystal display or LCD monitors which are lighter, much thinner and have less power. We will see some details of liquid crystal detail in the next lecture. This brings us to conclude the seventh lecture. Here we do not have any assignment questions.